Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Thank you to our panel. Um, I frankly am uh, looking forward to hearing their remarks today, and so mine are going to be very brief. But thank you to everyone in the audience. This is really a remarkable crowd. Uh, an overflow room is always a, a great thing to see, especially at a time of the year when people have so much going on with this place going back to school with kids back in the classroom. This is really uh, an amazing turnout and frankly a testament to how seriously we take this issue here in Connecticut. Um, I've chosen to refocus and re-up my work on the issue of climate change as a new United States Senator for one simple reason. Um, during the very short time that I have been in federal public office, this now being my seventh year, in those very short seven years, what began as the worst case estimates about sea level rise and temperature rise over the rest of this century are now the mainstream scientific estimates. In only a half a decade, all of a sudden, we have come to a consensus that some of our worst fears now may be coming true. During that exact same time that I've been in the House and in the Senate, I've become a father. I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old at home, and I shudder to think about what this world is going to look like um, at the end of this century when I hope that they may still be living on this earth if we don't make changes today. Because this is one of those issues that if you don't change habits now, the trend lines may be so locked in that they cannot be reversed by my children, no matter how well I raise them, no matter how smart they are, how prescient they become, no matter how turned on their generation is to this issue, it may be too late. Uh, and so that's why so many of us who came to the House or the Senate maybe five or 10 years ago caring about this issue um, now have it at the top of our priority list because we see a very short time window in terms of our ability to act. Um, and the reason why we focused here on Connecticut is because just in the last 12 months, we have had firsthand witness to the devastation that climate change can bring to this state. I think we probably all remember where we were the night that Storm Sandy hit. Um, I was at home in Cheshire. Our power had gone out. We didn't have a backup generator. I had a little bit of power left on my phone, and I was sitting up with our one uh, uh, lamp in our bedroom at about the witching hour of 11 or 12 o'clock, locked on to the small battery power that was sending me tweets from Norwalk and Stanford, not knowing whether or not the world was ending in those cities, not understanding whether those places would still be there the next morning. We barely survived Sandy, and yet the devastation still totals across the stretch in the billions. Um, we've seen what it can do here in Connecticut, and we know how vulnerable we are. As the panelists will tell you, um, we are really unique. We are a coastline state where almost all of our economic assets um, essentially run right along the stretch of the coastline, the two major thoroughfares of 95 and the Amtrak line, every major economic hub save for Hartford along the coastline. Some of our biggest economic drivers, like the casinos, for instance, within a relative short distance from the coast. Um, storms that used to be happening every 12 months in Connecticut are happening every six months now. Uh, just in 10 years, sea levels rising by an inch per decade. Um, for Connecticut's standpoint, we don't survive as a state or an economy if we don't get this right in the short run. Uh, and so that's why we wanted to convene this uh, group here today to um, expand upon a conversation that's happening at multiple levels. So excited to hear about the announcement that you uh, just heard about a new uh, climate prediction tool specifically dedicated to the Northeast um, that Yale and the center are going to be investing in. That uh, is something that is badly, badly needed because we are no longer uh, as interested in simply predicting how big the next storm is going to be. We need, in order to do real land use planning, for instance, in this state, amidst shrinking resources, to know uh, what's happening in the five and 10 year uh, time window. Um, that's what's happening here in Connecticut. And this is a focus here on the Northeast. But given the fact that this will be probably the only two hour time block in this week, last week, and the next week that I won't be thinking about Syria, <laughs> Um, 
let me make this contextual for you for a second, because this is about the effects on the Northeast. Um, but from 2006 to 2011, rainfall in Syria fell to below eight inches per year, which is the absolute minimum level necessary to be able to keep out agriculture going without irrigation. During that time, in order to make do with less water, tens of thousands of new wells were drilled all throughout Syria, having the effect of dropping the water table below the level that any of the pumps could reach. Agriculture during that five-year period of time disappeared in many regions of Syria, and in the regions in which it remained was reduced by about 75 to 85 percent. Over that time stretch, two to three million of Syria's 10 million people fell into destitute poverty, bumping up against all of the political refugees over the last 10 years that had spilled in from Israel and Iraq and other places. There are a lot of reasons why we're talking about Syria today. It's not just about a massive drought that was made much worse by temperatures already increased in Syria and the region that created a vicious cycle of evaporation that made um, this drought worse than any of the other droughts that it hit. There's a lot of other reasons um, at the top of the list still being the brutal repression of Assad and his family on the people of that country. But make no mistake, the turbulence that we have seen in Syria and in the Middle East is a consequence of climate change, a consequence of droughts that when they happen today happen harder, tougher, with more dire consequences than they ever did before. We are seeing the results of climate change in the Middle East. And while we may never become that fractious here, um, we know that if we don't make some changes here in Connecticut, dire times in a different fashion await us as well. Last thing to say is about politics. Um, I don't want to talk too much about partisan politics here today, except to say that the effort on climate communication um, is critical. And still at the top of the list as far as I'm concerned, Right now in Washington, about 56% of the House Republican Caucus denies that climate change exists, about 60% of the Senate Republican Caucus. 100% of the Republicans that sit on the Environment Committee in the Senate are climate deniers, as well as 17 of 22 that sit on the Science Committee and 22 of 30 that sit on the Energy Committee. Um, if we don't invest in education, about <laughs> the 99% <laughs> of scientists who tell us that our actions are contributing to global warming. We can't win this fight in Washington. We can't get anything done. We have to engage in a robust battle to change public opinion to make sure that people are sent to Washington that believe in science again. Or all of the work that we are doing on mitigation and new plans to reduce carbon emissions aren't going to mean anything. That being said, there is some really good news happening around the globe. Um, buried amidst the talk of Syria at the G20 was a breakthrough on the issue of HFCs, which are the substitute for the stuff that we got rid of uh, um, in the Montreal Protocols that was burning a hole through the ozone layer. HFCs, the substitute for um, CFCs, are now one of the most insidious climate pollutants in that they get into the atmosphere uh, and trap heat at a rate, frankly, that is much worse than traditional carbon dioxide. And for the first time, China at the G20 made a commitment uh, to begin a contact group with the United States to come up with some new standards to reduce the usage of HFCs. And the other G20 nations, including developing nations like Brazil and India, agreed to a uh, slightly uh, more um, beginning step uh, at the same work as well. Um, that's really, really good news. Um, uh, nations that we had just a devil of a time getting to the table to get serious about this issue now realize that it is in their interest to be with us today uh, on climate pollutants. Maybe carbon dioxide is a tougher nut to crack, but if you can take on some of these short-lived, fast-acting climate pollutants, things like HFCs or methane or black carbon, um, we can get a lot of pretty important work done. So as bad as things may seem in Washington, there, are, there is some good news when it comes to the international climate change uh, front. Uh, and it matters to everybody. 
who lives on this world, but here in Connecticut, as you will hear, um, it likely uh, matters as much, if not more, than everywhere else. We've got a fantastic panel uh, here today. I'm eager to hear your questions and your thoughts uh, as well. Uh, thank you to the Yale Climate and Energy Institute for hosting us here today, uh, and I hope we have a great discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.